discussions is going to be one of our concluding discussions on the bhagavad gita we will have two more sessions after this and we will be discussing a topic that we have already hinted at in many ways but we'll be discussing this directly for the for the first time this will be the search for oneness where is it right and where it goes wrong this will be based on bhagavad gita 1855 bhaktya mam abhijanati yavan yascha asmi tatvata tato mam tatvato gyatva vishate tadanantaram so bhaktya mam abhijanati the devotion those devote devotees can know me krishna says yavan yascha asmi tatvata as i am actually and tato mam tatvato gyatva and having understood me in this way vishate tadanantaram vishate they enter into that unlimited reality so tadanantaram so vishate and ananta tadanantaram this can give at first reading a sense of oneness oh so this verse seems to say by devotion you can know me in truth and after knowing me in truth you will attain you will enter into the one those who know me in truth will enter into the oneness vishate hmm? tadanantaram no actual word is not oneness it is anantaram will enter that unlimitedness or will enter the unlimited reality now what is that unlimited reality that is often the subject of uh, much philosophical uh, debate and we will try to in today's from today's context we will try to understand the sense of oneness now oneness is a very uh, where is a hotly debated subject in especially the broad indic philosophical context and there have been centuries of conflicts going on and i am not going to approach the subject from that perspective yes there are traditional debates by traditional commentators uh, from both traditions either from the impersonalist as well as the personalist traditions and in fact both of them have used um, war metaphors to especially within the madhva tradition and the shankara tradition uh, <clears throat> so there have been uh, there have been war metaphor books using more, not just war metaphors but book using my war metaphors so for example uh, dvaitik commentator wrote a book called advaita kalanala the ultimate fire of destruction for advaita kalanala is the fire of destruction the fire of destruction for advaitavad and then the advaitic commentaries commentators advait so advaitins are the followers of shankaracharya and dvaitins are the followers of madhvachari so the advaitins wrote a book called madhva mukh mardana smashing the face of madhva so often in the in that indian tradition the confrontation between oneness and uh, uh, dvaitavad and advaitad it has been a huge contest and it's almost like uh, when a book books were not that common in the past it is not so easy to write and replicate books no, to basically print, printing was not available so books were written by scholars for scholars so quite often what would happen is that so the uh, the dvaitavadis would write a book refuting mayavad and they would have that book carried on an elephant from udupi to shringeri and they would like drop a like dropping a bomb on the opposite party they would give that book as a gift to the advaitavadis and the advaitavadis would take that book read it and all the advaitin scholars would come together and they would try to write a refutation of the book and when they write a book they would put it on an elephant and send that elephant to udupi and that would be dropped over there and this went on for generations and the traditional adva oneness or uh, twoness duality or monism that argument was based primarily on interpretation of vedantic truths of vedantic statements specifically statements from the upanishads there is a prasthanatraya three primary sources of 
of spiritual knowledge that is the vedanta the upanishads and the uh, it's, it's called shruti smriti uh, it is called as prastha uh, <coughs> basically it is <coughs> shruti that is upanishads that is the nyaya that is the vedanta and the smriti is the puranas especially the, in within that the bhagavad gita was used so there's so traditional commentators try to write commentaries on the upanishads at least some of the upanishads then on the bhagavad gita and on the vedanta sutra so that is a whole intricate subject no as contrasted with that today in today's world oneness has a particular resonance and appeal so i will approach the quest for oneness from a contemporary perspective why is oneness so popular today uh in almost any any philosopher uh, from the broad indian background if you look at any philosoph any spiritual teacher or even generally spiritualists they tend to gravitate toward oneness and um, almost main, almost all mainstream spiritual teachers are proponents of oneness and quite often today's spiritual teachers neither are they themselves very world uh, by talking about spiritual teachers i'm not talking about spiritual teachers from the four vaishnava sampradaya necessarily i'm talking about spiritual teachers who are considered mainstream spiritual teachers in today's world they may or may not be affiliated with any any sampradaya but somehow they have, their voices become very important uh, in today's world so now if you look at it they themselves are not very learned in scripture they hardly quote much scripture nor are their followers interested in scripture so quite often when if we try to use scriptural arguments to refute impersonalism it doesn't register much on people why because their attraction toward oneness or their orientation toward oneness is not based on scripture it is based on something else so the whole idea of advaitavad was re-envisioned in uh, modern in modern times as not a merging into the absolute but as an attempt toward harmony and unity in this world so i repeat this difference and i'll elaborate on this later but <clears throat> advaitavad traditionally talked about oneness at the transcendental level hmm? we'll all merge into the non differentiated brahman hmm? whereas modern advaitavad hmm, some people call it a neo advaitavad so it focuses on how we can achieve oneness in this world and how we can achieve there is so much disunity so much disharmony and how we can achieve oneness in this world and that has great appeal today because Uh, the world is divided in many ways now we could say the world was always divided you know, there are different people for practicing different faiths or different belief systems across the world uh, as far as recorded history goes that is true but these people were not interacting so frequently the theological and the geographical matched quite often and people in certain parts of the world believed certain things and people in different another part of the world believed different different another thing but now today with there is so much so much uh, interaction in the world because of tourism because of trade because of employment because of politics so then as a result of that even uh, different people with their different belief systems uh, also interact with each other and that's why the differences in the belief systems have come up into a greater highlight and then how to address those differences that is an issue and oneness seems to be a logical solution to that in fact that is the way many indians try to have have like many indian spiritual teachers vedic spiritual teachers try to uh, gain a higher moral ground over christianity so what do i mean by that christians claim that jesus is the only way that the 
<clears throat> the impersonalists who were the prominent indian spiritual leaders they claim that actually there is only one way and whether it is jesus or mohammed or krishna or whoever they are all manifestations of that one way so you say there is only that yours is the only way we say there is only one way so in a sense your claim is divisive our claim is is more broad minded more in, more inclusive so it is also an attempt to capture the moral higher ground uh, so it was not just in terms of uh, the so so in the diver in the diversity that we experience in this world how do we avoid diversity from leading to dissension to conflict so for that there was the attempt to harmonize and but it went beyond harmonizing to homogenizing to make everything into one in some ways so that's why this is i mean this is a little elaborate contextualization for what i am speaking and um, but the, the way in which i am approaching the subject is not by quoting scripture this scripture verse says this and this is what this means and this what scripture says and this is what it means there are, i have given a series of classes in my ishopanishad course where we talk based on scripture but here i am going to speak based on why in today's world impersonalism appeals so much and uh, how we can address that longing for oneness that's why the title is also not impersonalism so much as oneness mm -hmm. so we all uh, oneness is appealing and even bhakti wisdom fulfills that longing for oneness how it fulfills is what we will be discussing today so there will be three points what's right about the uh, longing for search for oneness what's wrong about it and then we will discuss about oneness understood holistically so multiplicity leads to a mess so it's not just duality that we experience in the world duality is a philosophical concept where we see okay this is male this is female this is indian this is pakistani this is american this is russian or chinese whatever this is this we see twoness but we don't just see twoness actually we see multiplicity it's not just duality that we encounter in the world so multiplicity it can distract us it can divide us it can delude us and it can degrade us so let's look at these one by one how can multiplicity distract us because there are so many things to pay attention to so we keep looking for something new we can't focus on anything hoping to find pleasure we look for something new hoping that it will give us real pleasure and in that process we stay forever dissatisfied so this craving leads to this constant craving which is created by multiplicity so now this is a point which we have discussed frequently uh, how this is the driving force for materialism so uh, and consumerism the consumer industry constantly keeps giving us something new but this applies even in the spiritual domain where people instead of focusing on one spiritual path oh, there are so many so let me explore and if i get tired of exploring then if i just believe all paths are one then i don't have to go through all to exploring and evaluating the multiplicity i can just believe that everything is one so but multiplicity so oneness can be a simplistic solution to the problem of multiplicity so we are trying to understand what is the problem of multiplicity multiplicity leads to complexity complexity it becomes very difficult to navigate that at times multiplicity divides because different people get attracted not just to different things but even opposite things and it is not we are not just talking about opposite things you know i like uh, say somebody likes pizza and somebody likes paratha okay that's fine but here we are talking about even about ultimate interests we if different people have different hobbies that's not a people don't go to war usually over hobbies but quite often multiplicity especially if it is seen in the ultimate domain in the domain of ultimate interest so if my interest is in believing that this is the only god that is real and all gods are false then anybody who is worshiping any different god now i have to destroy that so multiplicity can create divisions and it is not just in the in the domain of personal of worshiping a deity it can be in various ideas so communism 
has the idea the ultimate interest is in in creating equality of results whereas capitalism has the ultimate interest in creating equality of opportunities so then these two are fundamentally different so it's not just uh, we are not talking about casual interest especially when we see multiplicity in the domain of ultimate reality however the ultimate reality is conceived it multiplicity divides and multiplicity deludes why because multiplicity itself is superficial if you look at things from a philosophical perspective then whichever way we look at it whether we look at the it from the modern scientific perspective or we look at it from the traditional sankhya perspective no everything is made up of the same material elements or atoms now for in fact for science um, as defined as scientism means when science claims to explain everything no beauty itself is a perplexity to science not just beauty even the world of sensory perception if everything is simply made of fundamental particles moving according to fundamental particles which are basically insentient which are colorless which are which are which are having no sensory properties and fundamental particles are moving according to uh, the impersonal laws of nature impersonal sense there is mechanical laws of nature then from that world how does the world of sensory perception with its attractive forms and attractive tastes and attractive fragrances how does it all come about that is very difficult now we may say okay when you add this component it is as you add sugar then it becomes sweet you add a particular color it becomes colorful okay that's fine but if we consider whether it's sugar we consider sugar or we consider a particular color compound how does it get its properties starting from the fundamentals it's very difficult to explain uh, and from a scientific scientistic perspective the multiplicity is an illusion if atoms are the ultimate reality then atoms are shapeless colorless order uh, at, at not atoms you get some some atomic particles they are so small as to not have any quantifiable uh, any 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 pro the properties that attract us in the world so in the same way if you look at it from a traditional perspective earth water fire air ether these are the components so how from those attractive forms arise it's confusing so the multiplicity deludes and ultimately the multiplicity degrades in pursuing the new we often become so obsessed as to end up becoming irrational immoral or even insane it's insane happens when people become addicted but even with respect to sensual pleasures people can become irrational and immoral where they start pursuing something new whether it be in terms of relationships in terms of uh, the politics that they might do in the workplace where uh, where is the multiplicity i have this and what somebody else has is different from what i have and i want that so multiplicity creates problems so now is oneness the solution as i said yes if 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 we could see that ultimately everybody everything is one then all the problem of multiplicity would go away hmm? we hope that seeking one underlying reality below all the multiplicity will book bring focus harmony elevation and enlightenment you know these specific words are related with the four points i talked about with respect to a multiplicity that it distracts it divides it degrades it deludes so focus harmony elevation and enlightenment are the solutions to the problem of multiplicity well, now will all this come about by oneness so oneness is talked about today not just in the terms of ultimate as again i'm emphasizing this point that oneness is today sought not just in terms of uh, the quest for the ultimate reality but also as a quest for harmony and unity in today's world and if you want to go here till now we are discussing what is right about the search for oneness now another way for looking at this is looking at this is that when we seek knowledge what are we trying to do actually when we say are we looking for information okay you know okay the capital of this country is this capital uh, or that this is the name of this river and this is the name of the species yes 
we may be looking for that but what are we do that might be called knowledge but when does it become knowledge basically the search for knowledge is a search for an explanatory category hmm? and the search for ultimate knowledge is a search for the biggest explanatory category by which um, things are explained completely so what do i mean by an explanatory category say so when newton saw the fruit falling and he asked what made this fruit fall so he was not just asking for a okay it was a specific incident that raised the question what made this fruit fall but his question was not just what made this fruit fall what makes things fall that was a broader question so it was not just a explanation that he was seeking it was an explanatory category that he was trying to understand so now that he was exploring and gravity comes as one explanatory category so we might say for example meet a stranger and we talk with them in english and then they just don't respond or they don't seem to understand and then maybe we understand we, they speak something and oh this person doesn't speak indian then we may try to translate using some software or find a translator so the explanatory category that we have got over there is okay this person doesn't speak english this person speaks some other language so this itself is a big philosophical point i'm not going to go into that in detail but the whole idea is that we seek when we seek knowledge we are seeking explanatory categories say if our phone stops working or our laptop stops working then we're not just okay why did it stop working oh because a particular component of the software got corrupted oh okay that's that's an ex, it's not just an explanation when you say the computer got corrupted there could be so many viruses there could be so many different ways in which the computer got corrupted it's a explanatory category now we can go deeper and analyze the explanatory category but we don't necessarily need to do that all the time so what we want to do ultimately is that we look for one explanatory category that explains everything so science is also seeking what is called as the theory of everything or they call it the grand unified theory so there are many different theories in science and can we find one grand unified theory that is a question scientists have been searching for that but as they have been searching they are realizing it's elusive and now more and more they have given up the quest for that or at least acknowledge that it's going to be very difficult to find it so this but in general oneness is also an intellectual quest that we see so much multiplicity in the world we need to place it some some explanatory category otherwise the the multiplicity of the world will overwhelm us and we want to simplify things so how do we simplify you know we simplify by placing things in boxes okay these people behave like this in this situation i am supposed to do like this in some situation i am supposed to do like that so for example when i am in workplace i conduct myself in a particular way when i am in home i conduct myself in a different way so that's a broad explanatory category so like that the search for knowledge also is a search for explanatory categories culminating in a search for one explanatory category that will explain everything and for many people oneness is that explanatory category everything is one if only we understood everything is one all conflicts will go away so for example in today's world in sociology now i am using sociology not in a technical sense over here but in a general sense of the study of human society when people fight over religion race caste creed nationality the thoughtful people may stress our oneness that we all belong to the same category that is humanity we are all human beings why are we fighting like this sometimes in in say movies about some sectarian violence be it say black white violence in america or be it hindu muslim violence in india sometimes in movies some of some some hero or somebody might show okay this blood is flowing can you identify which is a hindu blood or a muslim blood which is a black blood or a white blood we are all same we are all human beings so now what are they trying to do over there they trying to avoid or transcend conflict by pointing to oneness now we may extend this oneness beyond human human beings to all life forms 
we may say that animals also they also bleed they also suffer pain so we should not kill them so we are expanding the category of oneness or uh, sorry expanding the scope of oneness to include not just all human beings but beyond human beings to animals so the quest for oneness seems to be like a like a self evident solution to the problem of multiplicity and all the problems that come because of multiplicity and we because we live in a incredibly complex world in some ways we could say the world has always been complex but because of many factors especially because of the interaction between people from different cultures because of the complexity of the technology that because of the technology that we have and because of the complexity of often the jobs that we do so because of the so because of all these the world we live in today is far more complex than what it was in the past so oneness seems to be a natural solution to this problem of complexity we are all one well yes so this is where oneness is there's a lot that is right about the one search for oneness now let's look at what's wrong about this it's not so much wrong about the search for oneness but about our conception of oneness i'll talk that's why the last part will be oneness seen holistically but when we are searching also we are presuming certain things so if i'm searching for gold then i presume okay it is yellow in color it is shining and it's expensive so i need to have the budget for that so we have certain presumptions that drive us when we search for something so we will try to ex- reexamine some of the presumptions that drive the search for oneness so one presumption is that the one reality has to be formless and impersonal to be truly one and the reason for that is because form and personality often delude and they're temporary so now it's not just delude delude i'm using as a uh, one 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 term which is a catch all for all that we talked about delude distract divide degrade so the idea is that why does this happen what makes us not see oneness its form its personality different people are different so form it can be color it can be genealogy it can be whatever it is and people have different personalities also so it deludes and it it's temporary so now what's right and wrong about this assumption yes what is right is obvious that specifics often divide okay this person is from has this color this person has this nationality the specifics divide but then what is wrong is does removing the specifics unite so when we now universals are usually seen as the opposite of specifics but when we when you say that the universals to get to the universal we have to remove the specifics does the removal of specifics unite so we can consider that what is the removal of specifics we are all one okay but what do you mean by we are all one you know what when we say we are all human beings okay okay agreed we are all human beings but what does it mean now if we extrapolate it beyond to this beyond this platitude now the pla- i'm using the word platitude not in a negative sense yes we are all human beings and we all have shared human interests but if you want to understand what is one about all human beings it is our humanity well what do you mean by our humanity well we all share the same pains and sorrows or do we really well sometimes we do sometimes we don't but so what is it just our sentience that is similar uh, what exactly is it that is uh, common when we say oneness is there which will unite which so it's our capacity for you know everybody experiences pain everybody experiences joy okay that's our sentience but sometimes people experience pain and joy in opposite things now somebody who is a vegetarian will feel pain when they see somebody eating non vegetarian food somebody who is a non vegetarian they meat might be their favorite food you may say here this simply ignorance okay we may that, that is a that is a simpler exa- example you might call it ignorance over here but as i said there are different conceptions of ultimate interest that people have 
and so where is the oneness as an emotion oh everything is one as a emotional aspiration we all want to be one that is good but beyond emotion be become beyond oneness being an emotional aspiration is emotion is is oneness grounded in philosophical reality for oneness to be grounded in ultimate reality we will see that the ultimate reality will have to be stripped of desire emotion and love why because if we consider it is it is if we may say okay we don't want to be divided over race race creed gender nationality okay that's fine we shouldn't be divided but these are the things that trigger our emotions most often quite often even if we say relationships you know it's uh, the traditional attraction is between males and females and while that attraction can lead to sensuality that attraction also leads to reproduction and that's what sustains the human race so if you are going to say that ultimately everything is one then we go beyond everything material to the spiritual okay but what is that spiritual so the spiritual if we say that everything that triggers material triggers emotions in this world is material and then whatever is left after we remove all that triggers the divisive emotions and desires within us then that will basically be like a formless personalityless amorphous kind of hazy substance and then the emotional state coming from that will be desireless emotionless loveless peace so that is almost akin to a stone like insensuous so in general now we say oh we are all belonging to the same species. we all all we all share humanity well fine but you know it's not very easy to love humanity actually i would put it the other way it's very easy to love humanity in concept there's a there's a comedian who said that i love humanity it's only human beings i have problem with <laughs> what he meant by that is that actually it is with human beings that we have to develop relationships individual human beings and then there is a the problem with that you know maybe their personalities and our personalities don't match and that's where commitment is required that's where sacrifice is required that's where humility tolerance all that comes into the picture so in one sense we could say i love humanity but i hate i hate human beings it's very easy to say i love humanity because there is no no tangible commitment involved over there and if we go really deep into that you know what are we loving when we say i love humanity well we are just actually having a self congratulatory uh, sense of superiority i love all of humanity well the love for humanity has to be expressed by love for specific human beings and then that love for specific human beings can expand but oneness as conceived in a simplistic sense oh, we are all one that strips reality of everything that is attractive and then it makes our existence a stone like insensuous so now this is where the bhagavad gita and the bhakti tradition describe that just like we say that not all things uh, not all equalities are equal so not all specifics are the same so it's not spe- specific so much that divide if we consider this way there are material specifics and there are spiritual specifics so if we consider the, i'll come back to this later in terms of a four quadrant diagram but here it's simply this much that if we consider there is a point of origin where there are no specifics and there are, so material specifics they divide and spiritual specifics are different from material specifics and spiritual specifics are a part of the ultimate reality now how they will unite that we will have to discuss but the presumption that specifics divide therefore removal of specifics will unite is not exactly the removal of specifics 
will remove everything that drives us to action it will remove everything that makes life worth living removal of specifics imagine if in the world there were no people there was just this amorphous concept of humanity well whom would we love whom would we reciprocate with what would we do we can't we can't have a rich reciprocal relationship with uh, with the amorphous conception of humanity we need specific people now of course the people whom we love have problems we have problems and that is a problem but just depersonalizing everyone and talking about abstract sense of oneness that is not the solution so oneness although so in one sense we want oneness no doubt but if that oneness is extrapolated to a psychological or a spiritual level it it or is not extrapolated extended to a psychological or spiritual level then it leads to stripping away of everything that drives us to action so when people say that oh we should not fight over sectarian things true we should not fight over sectarian things but why should we not fight because we are concerned about specifics so we may encounter somebody who is wounded we see one human being who is wounded we see another human being who is wounded and then we try to understand what is the commonality but the 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 perception of the commonality depends on our experience with the individuality oh this person was wounded this person was wounded and both of them are suffering pain those are both of them are concrete individuals who are suffering pain and then we think oh i be, i don't want to be a part of anything that causes pain like this so what should i do so it is specific experiences that drive our emotions and we need emotions as an integral part of our of a life well lived so so can we absolutize oneness so now i am not this is this itself is general, i said earlier that i will not approach this so much from a scriptural or a philosophical perspective because we are discussing the whole gita from a more contemporary perspective but these are but there is some mention i will have over here that from a philosophical perspective these two questions i have traditionally uh, tormented proponents of oneness if oneness is all that ultimately is the reality then the question comes from come two questions basically and come up where does multiplicity come from and where does our attraction to multiplicity come from oh beyond all this diversity there is one reality and that is the, that is the reality okay if that non differentiated unlimited brahman as it is called in the vedic text in the upanishad specifically brahman is the ultimate reality then where did the multiplicity come from and why are we attracted to the multiplicity these two are very fundamental questions which which imperson which those who absolutize oneness find it difficult to understand they say oh actually this is an illusion yeah agreed that this the other sense of multiplicity is an illusion but if there is only one ultimate reality as i say ekam satya jag brahma satya jagan mithya so then okay if the brahma is satya then where is the mithya come from where does the illusion of multiplicity come from and where does our attraction to that multiplicity come from so now we may say that as i said let's look at these two questions a little bit later where does illusion come from so is there only oneness or is there oneness and illusion well there is illusion and beyond illusion there is oneness if you see beyond the illusion you will see oneness that means illusion is also a reality at least in our experience then where does illusion come from then we have not oneness but twoness as we may have multiplicity of the specifics in this world but in the philosophical terms also what we have is not oneness but twoness there is illusion and there is reality but we may say oh, no 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 illusion is temporary reality is eternal agreed but where does illusion come from see now illusion doesn't exist at all it's just illusion well okay if illusion doesn't exist then why am i in illusion so where illu- 
when we say illusion doesn't exist it's just our conception okay but where does the conception come from this is the famous question that there is no water in the mirage but for me to be to mistake that there is make the mistake that there is water in the mirage there has to be water somewhere otherwise why would i mistake it to be the mirage so where does my illusion perception come from my illusion perception so there are two different realities over here as i said you know we could go very elaborately into refutation of impersonalism at a philosophical level or at least an analysis of impersonalism so the illusion is that there is a mirage that there is that i think there is water in the mirage so that th- my thinking that there is water in the mirage is illusion but there is a illusion perception that there is i and i am thinking that there is water in the mirage so there must be i must have there must be some water somewhere there must be something which i must have experienced as water earlier for me to mistake this to be water so where did that come from and even beyond that so where does my perception come from because there is a reality there is a illusion and then there is a perceiver who perceives that this is the illusion and this is the reality so where does the perception of illusion come from and where does the perception that i am a perceiver come from if everything is ultimately one let me explain this diagrammatically but let's this idea that there's a mystery of consciousness now this can be seen from a scientific terms this can also be seen from philosophical terms i say actually the reality is reality is what we see at the material level is not the real thing it's constantly changing so yeah nobody denies the idea of change the idea is that is actually you know perceived reality it's an illusion that is like a con- it is convenient operational fiction so this is a term which is used in 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 philosophy of science or philosophy in general it's like a convenient fiction or a convenient operational fiction that when we look at a, a burning candle we don't need to know that actually there is no such thing as a constant flame there are actually continuously the candle is burning and a burning is creating an illumination which, which is actually constantly changing so so reality is like that things are constantly changing but from our perspective it's a operational fiction it's a convenient fiction to consider that there is one flame yeah that that may be true but there is a problem here for some whether that flame is constantly changing or the flame is constant to evaluate that there has to be an observer who is different from the flame so basically the mist to understand the mystery of consciousness or to analyze oneness what what is what are the components that need to be understood or analyzed uh, this might i might have gone to a little philosophical domain now let me try to make it a little clearer so if we say this is a reflection this oh this all everything is just a reflection it's a perception it's a illusion perception So, so I'm talking about in philosophical there's pratibimba vad, and then there is Maya vad has categories. So, <clears throat> chaya yokta ya. There is <clears throat> that the world is like a shadow. The world is like a reflection. There are many things in that, and I'm not going to analyze all of them. But I'm just placing that in the broad category. Reflection is possible when only when there's a reality to be reflected, and there is an observer who perceives the reflection. so if there is oneness oneness is the ultimate reality then why is there illusion and why is there someone who perceives the illusion so the holistic understanding is that yes there is a reflection and there is a reality the material form personality variety are the reflection the spiritual form personality variety is the reality so i'll explain this in due course now oneness understood holistically so this is where we will come now this what is meant by oneness so broadly in our perception of uh, whenever we perceive the world there are three components there is a subject of consciousness that is we ourselves then there is the object of consciousness what we are perceiving 
and in between there is a stream of consciousness so so for example now we might see something attractive an alcoholic may see a bottle of alcohol and they get attracted to it so what is happening there is they are the subject of consciousness then there is the bottle of alcohol that is the object of consciousness and there is a stream of consciousness which moves from the object to the subject so now as a psychological idea we are all one is is fine but when you take it to the philosophical level and actually examine what what oneness will imply what oneness ultimately implies is this that the stream of consciousness is all that remains that there is neither the subject nor the object there is just consciousness the object that that there is something to perceive and that there is someone to perceive both are illusions only the stream of consciousness remains well what does that stream of consciousness do the uh, consciousness itself is a mystery but if you think of it from a serious philosophy even if you think of it seriously if there is nothing to perceive and if there is no one to perceive can we really say perception exists if there is nothing to be conscious of and there is no one to be conscious what does consciousness even mean you know consciousness without subject and object is it really consciousness at all and what would that consciousness do just exist but what would it experience would there is nothing to experience practically speaking so not just practically speaking philosophically speaking also so is this is this the kind of oneness that we want but when we are looking for oh ultimately you know everything that we are attracted to is an illusion when say animal rights activists say that oh you know our sense of oneness we should extend beyond just humans to other species to other species also you know they often call this as be concerned only about humans as speciesism that you know we are attracted only to one species and not to other species we humans should progress and go beyond speciesism yes it's good to go beyond speciesism but you go beyond speciesism because you observe animals and you seen how animals are also having emotions like humans and because of your attraction to animals you we want to extend the explanatory category so the point is that it is specifics it is say if somebody experience with dogs or with cows or with any of the animals that we may we may dehumanize and or depersonalize and objectify and exploit because of seeing them as sentient beings that we want to explain expand the category oh you know we we should love all all living beings not just all human beings good but so so it is the expansion of consciousness which uh, which makes us look for oneness okay we yeah. allow all living beings not just human beings and allow the environment not just uh, the people within that okay we are expanding the category but what is happening here is in expanding our uh, objects of respect or love or objects of um, uh, affection what is happening is we end up removing the very basis of affection the basis of basis of affection or compassion is that there is a subject and there is an object and the subject perceives how the object shares some similar characteristics but if there is neither subject nor object then what is left to experience that is why oneness is not very fulfilling either intellectually or emotionally so at a simplistic level yeah diversity multiplicity is the problem oneness is a solution good but if you go deeper either in terms of the emotional aspect or the philosophical the rational aspect we find that simplistic conceptions of oneness are a problem so we often talk about unity and diversity 
what the bhakti tradition tells us is bhagavad gita talks about is that there is not just unity in diversity there is diversity in unity what do we mean by this there is subject of consciousness there is object of consciousness and there is a stream of consciousness and all of these are within one reality so oneness does not require the dissolution of the subject or the object it requires understanding that both subject and object are parts of one ultimate reality now what is that ultimate reality that is the personal absolute let's understand this sometimes we think that say i am here we go to a temple say and we may worship krishna say i am here and krishna is here and i am worshiping krishna yes that is true we are trying to worship krishna we are trying to love krishna at the same time you know we are already parts of krishna so it is not that i am here and krishna is there i am here and krishna is also here but right now i don't realize that krishna is here that's why there is a manifestation of krishna here and i can worship them and as i worship him more and more then i will realize that krishna is here also krishna is in my heart also so the idea is that when uh, when we understand the bhakti reality we we don't see krishna as only the image who is in the altar krishna is a inclusive reality in that sense krishna includes us now shri prabhupad in uh, nectar of devotion introduction says that that krishna means everything krishna means him and his energies and we and we are all his energies so we may sometimes differentiate krishna from his energies for the purpose of worshiping and that is good at the same time philosophically krishna includes all his energies so what it means is that krishna is if you consider from this perspective analysis krishna is the object of consciousness krishna is the subject of consciousness and krishna is also the stream of consciousness now when we say this is krishna it is krishna in his different manifestations let's understand this so oneness reenvision within the bhakti tradition there is the subject of consciousness so in the mundane perspective the subject of consciousness is a physical creature you know like we are this is a dog this is a cat this is a human being this is basically biological species this is a physical creature but in the spiritual understanding one actually the subject of consciousness is a embodied soul the soul is pure and the soul's consciousness is filtered through its embodiment then what is the object of consciousness within the worldly vision it is within the mundane material vision it is various worldly objects but from a spiritual perspective it is the all inclusive ultimate reality with various energies so if we are attracted to someone beautiful now does at one level say this beauty is temporary it is illusion well yes that's that's one way of looking at it but another way of looking at it is we also understand that this beauty is a spark this beauty manifests a spark of krishna's ultimate beauty so it is seeing the separateness of this beauty from krishna's beauty that is what is going to cause illusion so the object of consciousness actually speaking is not various specific worldly objects it is those worldly objects in connection with krishna so we may see the beauty of nature and if you understand that this beauty of nature ultimately comes from krishna then that is a holistic vision so that so we don't need to uh, we don't need to say that the objects of perception are illusion the objects of perception are real it is just that we are seeing them disconnected from the ultimate reality so the sec- so the 10th chapter of the bhagavad gita repeatedly talks about how i am this among mountains i am the himalayas among rivers i am the ganga among water bodies i am the ocean and there are very specific many specific things krishna gives so if he say i am these he is not dismissing them all as illusion he saying i am these that means that these are the objects which we can perceive from a holistic perspective as mani- as being a manifestation of krishna 
And then what about the stream of consciousness? The stream of consciousness is often seen as uh, the product of the materially agitated mind or the activated brain. There are brain signals going on, there are emotions going on in the mind. Well, okay. That is, that, is, that is a part of it. But the stream of consciousness essentially is the innate energy of spiritual personality. And there is, the, there is a supreme spiritual personality and there are smaller individual personalities. So ultimately our consciousness is a part of the cosmic consciousness, which is Krishna. So Krishna is the supreme person and we are finite persons. So all these three we talk components. So for attaining oneness, we don't have to remove the subject and the object of consciousness and leave and be left only with the stream. We have to see that the subject and object and the stream are all placed within one reality. And that one reality is Krishna. Now for the purpose of reciprocating with Krishna, Krishna may be an object of perception and we may be the subject. And that's fine. But even then, we understand, even when we are worshipping Krishna on the altar, we understand that Krishna is not only on the altar. Krishna is there in the heart of the person who is standing next to me and worshipping Krishna also. That's why I will not say st step my foot on them. I will not touch them with my foot. Now, right now, I cannot perceive Krishna there. That's why I focus my attention on the altar. But I at least intellectually understand this, philosophically accept that as a proposition. And gradually, I will move toward that realization. So, <clears throat> we move forward here. Okay. Mm, there's a lot to discuss still. So, if, if you consider from the four quadrant diagram perspective, so that is, as I said, there is reflection and there is reality. So, when the reflection is real and the real, sorry, the reflection and I will not call it the reality over here, call it source of reflection. So, there is a reflection and source of reflection. When both are real, the reflection is material form, personality, material specifics, and spiritual specifics are the source of that. I think the mirage to be real because I have real experience of water somewhere. I'm attracted to forms in this world because there is an attractive form somewhere else. So the, the Gita's teaching is that the reflection is real and the source of the reflection also is real. What materialism holds is that the reflection is real and the idea of there is any world beyond this world, that is all false. That is just some hocus pocus that some religious religious teachers have taught and naive people believe to feel good. Hmm. Now, what impersonalism says is that, that the source of the reflection is real, but the reflection is false. Hmm. And nihilism is the idea that nothing is real. This world also is false and everything else is false. So, so, so Gita's teachings are not just personalist, they are transpersonalist. So if you want to see personalism revisited and form revisited, this is a few concluding slides. So if you could say personalism in terms of simply material personalism, the problem is there is limitedness of personality that leads to frustration. The people don't understand us properly. People have defects. They let us down. They disappoint us. They betray us. That's why I, say, I don't want anything to do with people. Well, that's, that leads to the other extreme, that impersonalism. But impersonalism, if sometimes people are frustrated, just leave me alone, you might say. But how long? Even people who say leave me alone, they don't want to be left alone forever. Certainly not. You know, why? Because we want reciprocation. If there is impersonalism, that leads, to, that leads to lack of reciprocation, which leads to emptiness and frustration. So transpersonalism is the idea that there is all attractive personality with whom we can have unending reciprocation. And that brings ultimate fulfillment. So Krishna is that ultimate explanatory category. And he, to uh, attain, arrive at that, we don't have to remove subordinate explanatory categories. So if you want to re revisit form, material form, it's not eternal. And that's why you get attracted to the form and then eventually that form decays. Since formlessness, unfortunately, it's not very attractive. If so, how, how do we even conceive formlessness? How do we get attracted to it? How do we develop any kind of relationship with it? It's not possible. So transcendental form is 
it is the balance between it is not it it is eternal and it is eternally attractive and that is the form that krishna has and it is that krishna we all are a part of so ultimate in oneness is not by dissolving individuality but it is by harmonizing our intentions so harmonizing our intentions means that we see that serving krishna is in our ultimate interests that we don't have to have separate interests we all can serve krishna in our particular way but the serving krishna that is our ultimate interest so that is the ultimate oneness it is not not a oneness that requires the removal of the subject and the object but rather the sub, we see that subject and the object are all within one reality and just as say <laughs> the idea of we are all belonging to one family so we have some shared interests we are all belonging to one nation we have some shared interests so it is har- if when we say that oh don't fight over hindu muslim or black white okay what are we trying to say over there we are the essential point is harmonize your intentions not that you just uh, deny all uh, all specifics so that harmonization of intention happens when we have that inclusive vision of the ultimate reality so the oneness of love 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 if that is what we want to experience and that is what we all long to experience the oneness of love requires the twoness of lover and beloved and then it, it unifies them by their shared love and that is the oneness of bhakti it is a harmonization of intentions not a dissolution of individuality so the bhagavad gita urges us to go beyond the urge to merge to the longing for loving the urge to merge it will lead to some peace but it is unsatisfying it is unfulfilling peace whereas the longing for loving it leads to enduring fulfillment and that is what is what the bhagavad gita leads us to so when krishna is saying vishate tadantaram he is saying not just that enter into that that impersonal void which is a stream of consciousness he is talking about enter into that ultimate reality where everything is seen as part of one ultimate reality and that is the call of the bhagavad gita it is the call for call to enduring spiritual love it is not a call for uh, for a oneness that denies the very reality of love but it is a oneness that celebrates the reality of love the eternal supreme reality of love so i'll summarize what we discussed today i talked about broadly three things the before we discussed that why oneness has appealed today so much and uh, it is because the world is so divided and fragmented that we lo- long for oneness and then within that i talk about what's right about the what's right about the quest for oneness that multiplicity it divides it deludes it distracts it degrades so there are so many conflicts in society when there are conflicts people may say don't see your sectarian differences see the oneness of humanity so that's how we can uh, uh, we long for oneness even in philosophy or in science we look for explanations not the specific explanations but explanatory categories and we try to look for the ultimate explanatory category and that is the, that is where we can seek oneness that is like the search for the grand unified theory so then we discuss what's wrong with the idea of with the quest for oneness is that yes specifics divide but removal of specifics doesn't necessarily unite because what drives us is is the experience arising from the specifics so a formless desire a desireless emotionless loveless reality is not what we aspire for and then we discuss briefly philosophically what is the problem with the idea of oneness that if we talk about oneness then the when where does uh, our perception of something other than oneness come from and that perception requires that we pursue things wrongly and we as perceivers exist to perceive things wrongly so why does where do both of these come from if there is a reality and there is a reflection for the reflection there has to be a reality that has to be reflected falsely there has to be a reflected medium that has to be there and there has to be a 
a perceiver who is perceiving it differently wrongly the candle may be a convenient the candles continuity may be a convenient fiction but to check whether it is a fiction or it is a reality there has to be some observer of the candle so basically in reality there are three components that there is a object of consciousness subject of consciousness and stream of consciousness and oneness if we if we take the simplistic conceptions of oneness to the ultimate conclusion what they require is the dissolution of the subject and the dissolution of the object then what remains is simply a stream of consciousness and whether it is even conscious that becomes a big question when there is no one to be conscious and no nothing to be conscious of so the bhakti tradition explains oneness in a different way it is not by dissolving individuality but by showing that everything belongs to one reality as its diverse energies so the object of consciousness the subject of consciousness and stream of consciousness are all parts of krishna so krishna is not just one reality among many realities although that is how we may treat say when we go to a temple and worship krishna but krishna is the one reality that underlies unifies all realities that manifests as the various realities that we perceive and what we perceive are also reality so the worldly objects that attract and delude us they are not illusion our perception of them is an illusion they are themselves real and the journey towards reality means to see them properly so then we discussed that four quadrants first we discuss how material specifics and spiritual specifics are different one is below the neg- below the below the zero point on the negative axis other than the positive axis in the four quadrants to consider reflection and reality if we consider only the uh, we consider so uh, some the, the reflection is what we perceive is the reflection real and is the source of reflection real so the gita says that both of them are real uh, materialism holds that only the reflection is real monism or impersonalism holds that only the real the source of reflection is real and nihilism holds that nothing is real mm. but by and we see that we talk about the pendulums with respect to personalism and form and concluded that for getting oneness in its fullness we don't have to succumb to the urge to merge but rather we need to follow the longing for loving to its ultimate fulfillment thank you very much hare krishna so you can see we have we have a few questions let's see how much we can take now yeah entering the kingdom of god means it is let's put it this way that see krishna is not necessarily explaining everything everywhere so we can't really expect that also from uh, uh, there are specific points which are explained at specific places and oneness is a general philosophical conception there's nothing wrong with oneness it is often how we interpret oneness that is a problem so krishna is simply stating over there that there you will enter the spiritual world they let attain the spiritual king the kingdom of god in the kingdom of god of course there is a recipro- there are loving reciprocation and loving reciprocation means that there is there are relationships there is the ob- subject and object the object is ultimately krishna and the subject are the pure devotees of krishna so is the reality we experience an illusion of the ultimate reality now an illusion of the ultimate reality is a interesting uh, way of putting it when we say what do we mean that is the reality an illusion of the ultimate reality is it a illusion created by the ultimate reality well yes it's like a exam created by a t- teacher to test the student mm-hmm. so in that sense it is a illusion created by the ultimate reality what is its purpose purpose is twofold it's experimentation and redirection we want to exp- we want to experiment various alternatives to krishna and we get the opportunity for that and after experimenting these various alternatives we turn toward krishna ultimately hmm. 
okay if the souls are discrete then how are they parts of krishna well they are discrete parts of krishna there is there are different points when we there are times when we study when we uh, specif when we emphasize different attributes say for example if many of us are say indians say living in america then when we are dealing with americans we may identify ourselves as indians but then when we are among each other we may still there may be some further differentiation okay you know this person is a punjabi this person is a maharashtrian this person is a south indian a south indian itself is a is a generic category within that if you look at specifics there are differences in culture between say tamilian and telugu or uh, <clears throat> kerala malayalam or there's so many diversity differences are there so at certain points uh, some points sometimes the commonality is emphasized sometimes the uh, some the individuality is emphasized so the soul is a part of krishna the soul is discrete in the sense that it is a it is a individual but the individual is a part of krishna so discreteness and connectedness can both go together because the connectedness it does not require the dissolution of individuality that is the fundamental teaching of the gita that we are discrete parts of krishna not that we are ultimately disconnected we are we are discrete in the sense that each of us has individuality and individual free will and when we say we are parts of krishna means so we shouldn't think of this as often we think of a part as a, like a screw driver which is a part of the machine well yes that is an example that is given and it is it is true in one sense but to better understand the word part of krishna we can look at it in more in terms of a pa- playing a part in a in a drama so there is an ongoing drama going on and each character in the drama is an individual but they are all one in the sense that they are enacting a script and they are all their all purpose the shared purpose is to enact the script properly so that the drama is depicted and exper- experienced in a relatable way so so rather than thinking of the part as a as a mechanical part of a machine we can see that as a conscious being within a within a drama which is meant to be a experience which is meant to be a relatable conscious experience that way we can understand okay. so seeing the object seeing the objects as disconnected from krishna is that an illusion in my mind when i perceive the objects as real and not from krishna well perceiving the objects as real is not the problem perceiving the objects as separate from krishna is the problem so beauty is real say so taste is real fragrance is real what is the problem is that when we think that these can satisfy me our longing for happiness we we long for happiness constantly and permanent happiness can't be had in separate objects okay now okay <clears throat> is oneness to be understood in qualitative or quantitative terms mm. see qualitative and quantitative if you want to talk about oneness it's it's a little complicated what are we meaning by that generally prabhupad uses the word qualitative and quantitative in terms of the fact that we are like a drop and krishna is like the ocean so the drop is it the same as the ocean or is it different from the ocean qualit uh, well quantitatively it is different qualitatively it is one mm. yeah that is that you know that is one explanation to understand it so yes quantitative so quantitatively there is uh, difference and qualitatively there is oneness that is true at the same time in in our case the drop and the ocean example is 
is not a complete example necessarily because no example is complete and in the case in the, the drop if it enters into the ocean does it still exist or does it not exist well well generally to our observation it doesn't exist but if you consider a drop as made of fundamental water molecule then the molecules water molecules continue to exist so at a quantitative level there is there is difference at a qualitative level there is oneness you could say that yeah how did the living entity fall down and get separated from brahman according to mayavad well the, generally the question of origins has no answer no philosophy no philosophy that i have encountered has got a good answer so i would only say there are bad answers there are worse answers and there are worst answers so my understanding is that to say that the material materialism has the worst answer that consciousness came spontaneously from matter mayavad has a worse answer that uh, that somehow it's all illusion why that that they don't and the idea that we fell from the spiritual world because we were we were envious of krishna that's a bad answer so there are no good answers in my understanding so what exactly is sayujya and what happens when a soul enters attains sayujya liberation well there is the impersonal effulgence so the soul enters into that and stays there the soul doesn't lose its individuality but the soul believes that it has lost its individuality it's a matter of conception so if the soul strongly desires oneness in the sense of the dissolution of subject and object um then what happens is in the blinding effulgence of the brahman there is no object that is pursued krishna is not pursued over there that's why we have hiranmayena patrena satyasapi hitam mukham <clears throat> please remove your blinding effulgence so that i can see you o lord so there can be darkness that can blind blind and there can be brightness also that can blind so the impersonalist sayujya mukti means that they are blinded by brightness it's like say if you are driving on a road and the opposite driver suddenly puts on the glare we get blinded we can't see properly so like that there is blind blinding because of brightness and then the soul thinks that okay there is just a stream of consciousness that is existing and that is sayujya mukti now depending on the nature of the nature of that particular living entity the person may live for a shorter or longer time um it's not why are we calling uh, monists as mayavadis by the way today when i talk about brahma madhvaites and gaudiya the advaitins and the dvaitins our tradition has not been so actively involved in debates with advaitins although there have been de- debates but our tradition has focused more on trying to establish a supremacy of the sweetness of krishna rather than specifically refuting impersonalism so so are they illusionists well mayavad is is not a label which we have given to them it is i think in the 13th or 14th century there is a the prominent advaitin scholar who used the word mayavad to describe themselves so their idea is that uh, as everything that we experience is maya and the ultimate reality is beyond our experience they don't say that the ultimate reality is maya but the mayavad is used to say that it's almost everything not almost but everything we currently experience is maya so they to stress how we are living in the domain of maya that's why that word mayavad is used by them then now followers of advaita now this is important i address this last question and we'll stop so 
followers of advaita take help of god while explaining mithya so for them it is the answer of where mithya comes from okay see there are different levels at which explanations are given in the standard point we says if you ask maybe as first or second standard student what is 3 minus 7 well you say 3 minus 7 can't be done but when they study algebra in higher secondary school something like that you 3 minus 7 is minus 4 so sometimes we also have refutations of mayavad at a particular level and then mayavad is also have answers to those questions so we often say that mayavad is talk about say we'll all become god and that is how it's not just that we alone uh, that's not actually the mayavadi teaching mayavadi teaching is that say like if you remember those three things subject of consciousness object of consciousness and stream of consciousness so mayavadis don't say that sometimes it is the subject of consciousness object of consciousness become one that we become god that is not the accurate mayavadi teaching it is actually both the subject and the object are illusion and only the stream remains however many modern advaitin or mayavadi teachers they have oversimplified mayavad so sometimes so they themselves you could say misrepresent mayavad now sometimes they may claim affiliation with shankara's advaiti teachings sometimes they may not even claim that affiliation sometimes they might be just uh, uh appealing to people's notions today so when there are teachers who say i will make you god uh, so there's a famous mayavadi teacher who says that i have not come to tell you i am god i have to come to tell you you are god this is not the teaching of advaitavad so it is a modern mayavadi teaching but it is not the teaching of advaitavad so the advaitavad is that the idea of god itself is an illusion and it is a it is a useful illusion to help us come out of illusion so when they take the help of god while explaining mithya what they mean to say is that mm, it's a little complicated say there are these four levels there is tamoguna there is rajoguna there is satvaguna and then the beyond that there is brahman which is the only reality now there is so this is the paramarthic reality the ultimate reality and these are the vyavaharik realities these are pr- practical or operational realities and we want to go from the vyavaharik to the paramarthic so they hold the idea that this is this is purusha and this is all prakriti so when brahman comes in contact with prakriti when brahman comes in contact with material nature so brahman in contact with tamoguna is is jada is matter brahman in contact with rajoguna is jiva and brahman in contact with satvaguna is ishvara or jagdish as we call it so jeev jagat jeev and jagdish or prakriti jiva and ishvara so brahman when perceived through the through tamas brahman in contact with tamas becomes jagat so they say that for us wherever we are to perceive brahman we can't perceive in the condition stage so so this idea of god and worshiping god it's all created by brahman by coming in contact with sattva so you worship the form of krishna you worship the form of durga you worship the form of shiva and then eventually you will go beyond that worship toward the ultimate reality so i hope that answers the question and we regard we'll stop here and we'll and we'll have two more sessions in the future which in which we'll be discussing about the concept of sharanagati and divine love and then finally we'll be talking about sanjay's realizations on hearing the gita so thank you very much re krishna